But let's talk about long-term investing because Rob, you're here. You asked me this question and I wanted to do a video on it. So I figured maybe we'll just talk about it a bit in this live stream because we're also talking about Netflix, but why I don't have any long-term investments. Um, so why, why do you guys think I don't have any long-term investments right now? What, what do you think is the reason for me not having any long-term investments, uh, in the stock market? I have, I do have some very, very small amount of, um, shares within, uh, Smile Direct Club, which overall is, I don't plan to do anything with those and a very, very small amount, um, of a very, very small amount of SPCE. But I want to see what you guys think. Why do you think I don't have any long-term investments? Uh, now they want to add in ads as well. Oh yeah, for Netflix, dude, that's 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 just suicide. I think. Like, uh, you think the market's overvalued? Yeah. So, in turn, defi uh, let's define long term. For me, long term is two to five years. Really, five. I because for me, as far as long term is considered, I don't think we live in an era anymore where you can invest for ten years plus and hold one stock. I, I really don't think we have that anymore um, because with tech. And everything changing so rapidly, a company's economic or like a company's timeline can change so drastically. Like, look at the state of Netflix five years ago. Look at the state of Netflix today, right? If you look at Netflix five years ago, there was Hulu, there was Netflix. It was overvalued, but there was no, um, you know, Paramount. There was no Disney Plus. There was no uh, HBO Max. Uh, maybe five years ago, but if you look, you know what I'm saying is look like seven years ago. If you were investing in Netflix, then it was much different than today. So for me, I'm saying like me personally, long term is like three to five years. I said two to five, but really three to five. But for me, the main reason is just that I have to buy it at a discount. So I think that when you look at fair value, I need to be buying half of fair value, right? I think that we all say we want to buy a company that's undervalued, right? And, and does anybody know what a fair value is? What When someone says fair value on a stock, what does fair value mean? I don't think I pay for a premium membership on here anymore. I don't. I don't pay for a premium membership on this anymore. Uh, but does anyone know what fair value is? Do I still pay for Morningstar? No. All right. We won't talk about that now. All right, so fair value is basically what the the company is worth if you were to liquidate everything, right? Basically, looking at the balance sheet, looking at a company that is going to, when you look at all of the financials, if you were could sell everything right now, what would the company be worth at this very moment? I want to buy it for less than that, right? Whenever I'm looking at a, at a fair value, I want to buy it for less than that. So for me, I'm looking at 50% of fair value. Fair value of Apple right now is like $110, which means that if I wanted to buy Apple at my requirements, I need Apple at half of fair value, which is like 55 bucks. Am I going to get Apple at $55? Like, let's just be honest. Like, I'm not going to get Apple at $55. So for me to be investing in long-term stocks, I need them at a deep discount. I can't just go get a deep discount unless I'm buying a company that is way, way, way too high of a risk for me to go putting $30,000 in long-term, right? If you look at, like I said, Apple right now, I would need Apple at like 60 to $90. Facebook, I would need Facebook probably down at $100 because I think Facebook right now is around fair value, but I need it at 50% discount. So I need Facebook at $100. I would need Amazon down at about $1,500. I would need NVIDIA down around $100. So I'm not going to get these prices, right? Uh, wouldn't you try to predict their growth? Yeah, but they're already overvalued. I don't want to buy something that's overvalued. Like I don't, I personally don't want to pay a premium for something that already has a premium on it. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, if I'm going to invest in something long-term, I want to already have skin in the game. So like, let's, let's use real estate as an example. Let's say that you can buy, I don't know, real estate prices in California, but let's just say like the state of California two years ago before COVID and everything, when California was like at its height, if you were to go buy a condo in Santa Monica for a million dollars, it's like 1,100 square feet, two bedrooms, maybe one and a half bathrooms for a million dollars. 
you know that's overpriced, but you're you're banking on the growth of the the community, the growth of real estate in that area, the growth of real estate across America, right? So yes, you could buy an extremely overpriced condo in an amazing neighborhood in an amazing part of the country, and it will probably grow, but your risk is extremely high. Why? Why would your risk be high buying a condo in Santa Monica for a million dollars? There's a couple, right? So the first thing would be you don't have any equity in it already. So you're you're buying a property at highs, right? And you're you're banking on it continuing to go higher. Right? So that's that's what and because California sucks. So that's your first problem is because you're buying at highs. So if you could buy that same property for $400,000, is it going to be still as risky? Like, of course not, because you already have a huge spread between what you paid for and what it's worth. The other thing, too, that makes it risky is that you are banking on, you know, for instance, California to continue to grow better, to continue to get uh, more and more, to get more companies to move there, to get more people to live there. And you're you're banking on the risk that the whole housing market is not going to crash. So the biggest thing is like, yes, you can predict the growth of the company, but if the company is already overvalued and trading at insane price to earnings ratios, your risk is significantly higher. Like if you look at, um, let's just look at Tesla PE ratio. I'm going to get a lot of shit, but Tesla's PE ratio right now is 209, right? So that does, does anyone not know what a PE ratio means? Does anyone not know what a PE ratio means? So your PE ratio is your price to earnings, which means what you're paying for, for the earnings of the company. So that means that for every dollar in profit that Tesla makes, you are paying $209 to own the stock. For every dollar that Tesla makes in profit, you are paying $209 to own the stock, which is insane. That's like, that's, that's freaking insane. And yes, Tesla, you can predict their growth, but it's like, if you were buying at a PE of 25 or which you're not going to see in most tech stocks right now, but if you're going to buy a PE of 25 or a PE of 50, right? When you believe fair value would give it a PE of 200, it's basically a given right? Like that's, that's what you are really trying to find here. You're trying to find a company that you believe fair value. Like, let's just, let's just look at this right now. Let's say Apple PE ratio. Okay. So right now Apple's PE is 27 and Apple is trading at $167. So let's say that you believe Apple is fairly valued at this price. We don't want to buy fair value. Right. If you're going to go buy a piece of real estate, do you want to get a deal or do you want to buy the sticker price? Right. I'm not trying to buy the sticker price. I could. I know a lot of people who buy the sticker price and they make money. Right. Like you can always do that. If the market's great, you're going to make money. Right. I know people who bought sticker prices three years ago and they're up like $100,000 in equity on their property. It's not that you can't make money. It's just that if you're going to buy in a great market, then yeah, of course you're going to make money on it. Right. Um, but let's say that we think Apple is at fair value and the PE ratio of Apple right now is 27.37. So that means our price to earnings ratio is 27.37. So if we believe the fair value right now is 167 on, on Apple and Apple were to go from 167 down to $90, that means the PE ratio would be cut in half, right? So instead of uh, you know a PE ratio right now, of 27, we would have a PE ratio of 13. So if you know that the fair value would give it a PE ratio of 27 and you're only paying $13.50, that's extremely important, right? Because you know already that you have a huge margin baked into the company. Uh, can you run a scanner for companies that are trading 50% of their fair value? Just curious. I'd like to see what shape those companies are in. So here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if you, you, I don't know if you can run a scanner, but there are companies like simply wall street. And you also have to understand too. I don't even, I don't know. Let me take this off. I don't know if, um, no, I don't, I don't have an account anymore. I was paying for it, but since I have not, 
really used any long-term investing in a while. Like I don't, I haven't really been looking at anything long-term. doesn't matter. So looking at the shape of those companies, you're right. Most of the time, a company that is trading far below fair value, it's not going to be in good shape. But the goal is to find a company that is in good shape that has a discrepancy, right? Because discrepancies happen all of the time, right? So for instance, if we look at SoFi, when you look at the economic landscape of SoFi and you look at the amount of debt that the company has and you look at, for instance, just in general, how like the how much of a gamble this company could potentially be, it's trading far below its its quote fair value. If you look at um what's another good one? Small Direct Club is another good one, right? It's trading at two dollars and twenty seven cents. But what you have to understand is a lot of these companies that are trading under fair value are way too risky for me to personally put a ton of money in long term. And on top of that, too, they're beaten to shit for a reason, right? They're, they're beaten to shit for a reason. And that's something you have to understand. Your goal as an investor is to find that golden fucking unicorn, to find a company that's trading 50% below fair value that is a really solid fundamental company that doesn't have a shitload of debt. Right. Those three things are what you're really looking for, because if you find a company that, OK, it's trading far under like I think one that could be worth it right now is DraftKings. Right. I, I think DraftKings could potentially be a really good long term investment right now, simply because currently it's under fair value. I believe fair value for DraftKings right now is about 30 bucks, twenty nine dollars. I think that if in the next five years to six years, if we can get all 50 states legally legal to gamble, it would be absolutely insane for the company, which I'm not saying that we can do. I think the leadership is good, and I don't think that they have so much debt that it's going to be a problem. So those are three things you can look for. But even at that, it's still a risk because if they can't get all 50 states or if you know something were to happen to where um, you know maybe they start making it illegal in some states where it's currently legal or they don't ever make it legal in more states like that's a huge issue for the company but what you have to do is find discrepancies in where a company is trading so for instance this is an inverse break but peloton peloton should have never been trading at 170 dollars why was it trading at 170 bucks right why was it trading at 170 dollars Because of right, the reason it was trading at $170 is because of all the pandemonium of the pandemic, right? We saw the stock go from 20 bucks all the way up to like $110 and then continue to run. Number one, because of FOMO, right? Number one, because of FOMO. So many people are afraid like, oh, this is going to continue to run, continue to run, continue to run, right? The second reason is because... There was originally a legitimate reason for this company to run because we were stuck at home. People were buying Pelotons. The stock continued to go up. It looked like their growth was going to be amazing. But then what happened? The pandemic didn't last, right? Like it lasted two years, but now they have so many, you know, uh, so much equipment just sitting in warehouses because they overproduced and now they can't get rid of it. So it's like that that's a huge indiscrepancy to the upside. Companies should have never been trading above that because that's not normal. Right? That's like that two years of the pandemic is not normal. So it's it's trading way above it. A really good example of a company that normally I would buy the living shit out of is Alibaba. Right? Alibaba, if it wasn't a Chinese company, fair value would probably be up around 200 bucks. I would be buying the living shit out of this. Now, why is this not a company worth buying, in my opinion, right? If you look at the fundamentals, the company is solid as fuck. It is extremely undervalued. Its growth has been great over the past 10 years. Why would you not buy it right now? China lockdowns. Yep, yeah, because because it's a it's a company in a communist country. So their government can do whatever the fuck they want. Right. They can they can tell them to shut down tomorrow. They can't do anything about it. Right. The United States could on top of that too, just say, OK, we're no longer allowing you know these companies to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So there's a huge risk. 
most of the time, and here's the thing, most of the time, everything is that's beaten up is fairly valued, right? When you look at risk, because there's a lot of companies that from a financial standpoint are under fair value, but from a fundamental standpoint are at that price for a reason. Does that make sense? Like when you look at Smile Direct Club, let's go back to this financially. And when you look at how much has been beaten down, which you should never do, you should never say, oh, this stock is down 90% from IPO. It should bounce, right? You never want to do that. But most of the time, that's what's going to end up happening. You're going to say, oh, the stock's down 90%. This is a value. Just because the stock is down doesn't mean it's a value. 95% of the time, it's there for a reason. Small Direct Club is losing market share. They have a shitload of debt, right? The company probably will go bankrupt in two years if they can't turn things around. Align, which is their competitor, is fucking killing them. So that company, while financially, you're like, oh my God, this is undervalued. You look at the fundamentals of the company and you're like, oh, no, that's, that's, <laughs> they're not, they're not doing well. Now, the other thing I want to talk about too is uh, real estate for me specifically. I've not been buying any um, simply because I don't like where the market is right now. But for me, I have all of my trading money, right? And I think it's easier to find a deal when it comes to real estate. I think it's easier to find a safe deal for 20, 30% below market value than it is to find a stock that's 20% to 30% below market value. So that is a huge reason why I think investing in real estate long term at this point right now is better than the stock market. The other thing is that I can go get a massive loan from a bank to go buy a piece of real estate. You know what I mean? Like if you if you go and look at let's just say this is my first time buying a home, but like Zillow uh, fucking King of Prussia PA. Um let's just see what's like on the market, right? I'm not going to actually like this would not be an investment property, but if we look at this house, right, for $889,000 within my area, I can go and put 3% down on $889,000 if I wanted to. Like obviously I'm not going to not going to go do that, but you can leverage so much freaking money from a bank. I can go control nearly a million dollar property for $26,000 and some closing costs, right? So for me, you're not going to go find a deal on Zillow, but let's say that this house was our neighbors. The guy was 90 years old. He recently died. He had no family in the area. They all lived in California, Utah, and the house needed some remodeling. I knew the family. I was able to tell them, I'll pay you six hundred and ten thousand dollars i'll take it off your hands this month i will do whatever you need to you don't have to worry about selling it you don't have to worry about fixing it you don't have to worry about anything you take advantage of an opportunity and i feel that you could pretty quickly and easily buy some properties that way which is how i bought my first duplex some guy's dad died left it to him he didn't want anything to do with it he lived in wildwood which is an hour and a half away from here and i got an insane deal on the property and from there i put five grand into it i got it reappraised and now the house is worth which i sold it at a at like two hundred and forty thousand, and it's now worth three hundred and ten thousand, which is just fucking insane Right. And, and and the and banks will give you a ton of money for it. And then when you want to go buy another property, banks are going to look at your real estate portfolio as an asset. So for me, currently where the market is right now, I would way rather invest in real estate than stocks at this point. Long term. Right. You have to realize I do still have a, like a lot of money in the stock market to trade with. Right. But. For me, when I'm looking at a long-term investment for the next three to five years, I'd rather actually be buying real estate, but not going and buying sticker prices on real estate, finding specific deals, you know, where opportunity cost is to my uh, advantage and then doing it that way. That's the way that I would personally be looking at it right now. I think it's the best way to do it um, at this point. But um, it's still, it's hard. It requires a lot of work. The downside to investing in real estate that way is that it's not liquid right? If the world crumbles, you can't just take the money out today like you could with stocks. Um, there's no liquidity. It takes time. Like I can go buy Alibaba stock right now. I, I can't do that with a piece of real estate. But for me, you know, I don't, I don't really care too much. If I was going to invest long term, I'd be buying SPY. 
right? I was already looking at that exact story happened to me last year. I got a three hundred thousand dollar property for one hundred ninety five next door to my house. Just might have, to. yeah, dude. Like, and that's the thing, you know, like you can find deals. And if you're crafty as fuck, which I want to do more videos on this uh, in the future, probably on like the other YouTube channel, like the the third one I'm starting, like you can get crafty with deals. Like you can go buy a, a, a property for like zero money down if you really want. It's just not easy to do. Like you really can't. You just have to find that golden opportunity. But as an investor, like that's what we're doing. Like if you even look at Warren Buffett, like Warren Buffett back in the heyday, even like, like he would spend 12 hours a day just reading financial reports and scouring thousands and thousands and thousands of companies and find like two that met his requirements and invested in those, right? That's what we're here to do. We're here to find those unicorn investments and those unicorn deals, right? And also in the meantime, trade, make a little cash. That's the goal. But yeah, for me, that's why I, uh, I personally don't invest long term in stocks right now because I would rather focus on real estate. And then I'm a little bit more, um, in my opinion, a little safer because at least I'm, I'm between two markets. But I think if I were to do anything, it would probably just be like the S&P 500 or like sell heavy cash. Like, let's say I had five hundred thousand dollars to go invest long term right now. I would rather go buy a couple of duplexes or worse comes to worse take $5,000 or $500,000 and sell far out of the money cash secured puts making only 14% return per year on that money. And I would sell cash secured puts on stocks that I would want to own for the long term. 